Welcome to the June 2017 podcast from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. This month, our podcast features abstracts of four scientific articles published in the June issues of the journal, as well as commentaries by Dr. Charles L. Cox on the article entitled, Return to Sport After Pediatric Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction and Its Effect on Subsequent Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury and Dr. Mark R. Hutchinson on the article entitled Intrarator and Intrarator Reliability of Arthroscopic Measurements of Articular Cartilage Defects in the Knee. Be sure to check out this month's Current Concepts Review article on venous thromboembolism following hip and knee arthroplasty, the role of aspirin by Dr. Javad Parvizi and colleagues. The authors note that the latest guidelines from the American College of Chest Physicians directly endorse, and those from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons indirectly endorse, aspirin as an effective agent for prophylaxis against venous thromboembolism, VTE. Aspirin is inexpensive, easy to administer, and reasonably well tolerated, requires no blood monitoring, has an excellent safety profile, and continues to increase in popularity for VTE prevention after total joint arthroplasty. This review article provides the pertinent information related to aspirin when it is used as a VTE prophylactic agent following total knee and hip arthroplasty. In this issue, jbjs.org presents a new image quiz, a six-year-old girl with knee and shoulder pain. Be sure to visit us online to access these features, as well as the full text of the scientific articles you are about to discover in the following podcast. Next, you'll hear the first abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Return to Sport After Pediatric Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction and Its Effect on Subsequent Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury by Dr. Travis J. Decker and Associates. Investigation performed at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Duke University Medical Center, Durham, North Carolina. Anterior cruciate ligament, ACL graft failure, and contralateral ACL tears are more frequent in children and adolescents than adults. The reasons for higher subsequent injury rates in this population are incompletely understood. The authors analyzed a continuous cohort of patients who were less than 18 years of age. Subjects underwent isolated primary ACL reconstruction with autograft between 2006 and January 1, 2014, and had a minimum two-year follow-up. Return to sport characteristics were described, and multivariable Cox regression modeling was used to identify predictors of a second ACL injury. Candidate variables included patient factors, age, sex, physial status, tibial slope, notch width index, surgical characteristics, graft type, surgical technique, measures of recovery, time to return to sport, duration of physical therapy, and patients' preoperative and postoperative sports involvement, primary and secondary sports, number of sports. A total of 112 subjects met inclusion criteria. Of these patients, 85 had complete follow-up data and were analyzed. The mean age and standard deviation was 13.9 plus or minus 2.1 years. 77% had open physes. The mean follow-up was 48.3 plus or minus 15.3 months. 77 patients, 91%, returned to sports, and 84% returned to the same sport. The main marks activity score at the time of the latest follow-up was 13.7 plus or minus 3.5 points. Patients were involved in fewer sports after ACL reconstruction, 1.48 plus or minus 0.92 compared with 1.83 plus or minus 1.01 sports before reconstruction. 16 patients sustained an ACL graft rupture, 11 patients sustained a contralateral ACL tear, and one of these patients sustained both. The overall prevalence of a second ACL injury was 32%. Time to return to sport was the only significant predictor of a second ACL injury, with a slower return being protective. Conclusions Pediatric athletes return to sports at a high rate, 91% after ACL reconstruction. Unfortunately, the prevalence of a second ACL injury is high at 32%. Within this population, an earlier return to sport is predictive of a second ACL injury. Next, you'll hear a commentary by Dr. Charles L. Cox on the article entitled Return to Sport After Pediatric Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction and Its Effect on Subsequent Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury. This is Dr. Charles Cox providing commentary for the June 2017 JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled 
returned to sport after pediatric anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction and its effect on subsequent anterior cruciate ligament injury. The title of my commentary is The Quandary of Treating Anterior Cruciate Ligament Tears in Children and Adolescents. In this therapeutic level four study of a continuous cohort of 112 patients, of which 85 participated, representing a follow-up of 76%, who were less than 18 years of age undergoing an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction surgical procedure and a mean follow-up of 48 months, Decker et al. reported an overall prevalence of a second ACL injury of 32%, with 19% for ipsilateral injuries and 13% for contralateral injuries. The authors report that a slower return to sport was protective against further ACL tears. The limitations of the study included the low number of patients, which constrained the ability to fully assess further prognostic factors such as graft choice, the unknown impact of the 76% follow-up rate on the results, the self-reporting of duration of physical therapy as well as return to sport possibly introducing error, and the unreported rate of a subsequent surgical procedure for meniscal or cartilage injury leading to a risk of a subsequent surgical procedure that is likely even higher than the risk reported for subsequent ACL tears in this age group. The findings of this study, taken in context with the similar findings in several other recent publications of a similar age cohort, necessitate that the treating clinician alter preoperative counseling of patients and families when treating an ACL tear in children and adolescents compared with adults. In a meta-analysis by Ramsky et al., non-operative management of pediatric ACL injuries resulted in persistent instability in 75% of patients, and these patients were 12 times more likely to have a medial meniscus tear compared with those who underwent operative management. As a result, there is almost an obligation to reconstruct a torn ACL in a pediatric patient because of a desire to minimize the risk of further injury to the knee and to allow a return to sport with the accompanying benefits of athletic participation. In other words, self-esteem, character development, work ethic, etc. The good news is that, in the current article, Decker et al. report a high rate of return to sport, 91%. This is essentially the primary reason for choosing a surgical procedure. However, the bad news is the reported overall rate of 32% for subsequent ACL tears. This result is comparable with the findings of Webster and Feller, showing a 35% subsequent ACL injury rate in a cohort of 354 patients who were less than 20 years of age at the time of primary hamstring ACL reconstruction. In a separate study of 561 patients by Webster et al., patients who were less than 20 years of age at the time of the index ACL reconstruction surgical procedure were six times more likely to sustain a graft rupture than patients greater than or equal to 20 years of age. Similarly, in a study of 288 patients who were less than 19 years of age, Morgan et al. reported that further ACL injury occurred in one in three patients over a 15-year time period. The treatment of ACL injuries in children and adolescents remains a complex clinical scenario. Because non-operative management leads to generally poor outcomes, a reconstruction surgical procedure is likely the best choice for maximizing treatment goals. However, the high rates of reported subsequent ACL injury, approximately 33%, are unique to this population. The increased prevalence of ACL injury with an earlier return to sport in this study is likely a surrogate marker representing inadequate neuromuscular rehabilitation. With these findings taken into consideration, the emphasis on secondary injury prevention should be the focus of further study, as it is likely that standard postoperative rehabilitation is insufficient in this population with a predisposition to subsequent injury. Next, you'll hear the second abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, Brace Success is Related to Curve Type in Patients with Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis by Dr. Rachel M. Thompson and Associates. Investigation performed at the Texas Scottish Rite Hospital for Children, Dallas, Texas. Curve magnitude and skeletal maturity are important factors in determining the efficacy of bracing for the treatment of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, but curve morphology may also affect brace success. The purpose of this study was to determine the influence of curve morphology on the response to bracing with a thoracolumbosacral orthosis. A retrospective review of patients managed with an orthosis for the treatment of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis who were prospectively enrolled at the initiation of brace wear and followed through completion of bracing or surgery was performed. Inclusion criteria were main curves of 25 degrees to 45 degrees and a riser stage of 0, 1, or 2 at the time of brace prescription. 
compliance with bracing, was measured with Maxim integrated thermocrons. Radiographs made at brace initiation, brace cessation, and final follow-up were used to retrospectively categorize curves with the use of the modified length, M-length classification system, and more broadly to categorize them as main thoracic or main lumbar. The effect of morphology on outcome was evaluated using chi-square and Fisher exact tests. 168 patients were included. There was no difference in curve magnitude at the time of brace initiation or in average hours of daily brace wear between groups. The rate of surgery or progression of the curve to 50 degrees or greater was 34.5% in M-Link 1 curves, 54.5% in M-Link 2 curves, 29.4% in M-Link 3 curves, 17.6% in M-Link 5 curves, and 13.6% in M-Link 6 curves. There were no M-Link 4 curves at the time of brace initiation. The rate of surgery or progression to 50 degrees or greater was 34.1% in the combined thoracic group and 15.4% in the combined lumbar group. In brace-compliant patients, the rate of surgery or progression to 50 degrees or greater was 30.3% in main thoracic curves and 5.3% in main lumbar curves. One-tenth of curves change morphology during bracing. The rate of surgery or progression to 50 degrees or greater was 35.8% in persistent main thoracic curves, 20.0% in persistent main lumbar curves, 12.5% in main thoracic curves that became main lumbar curves, and 0% in main lumbar curves that became main thoracic curves, P equals 0.0383. Conclusions Thoracic curves are at greater risk for brace failure than lumbar curves are despite similar initial curve magnitudes and average amount of daily brace wear. A change in curve pattern may imply flexibility and is associated with brace success. Patients with thoracic curves should be counseled accordingly. Next, you'll hear the third abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Interrater and Intrarater Reliability of Arthroscopic Measurements of Articular Cartilage Defects in the Knee by Dr. David C. Flanagan and Associates. Investigation performed at the Department of Orthopedics, the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. Cartilage lesions of the knee are difficult to treat. Lesion size is a critical factor in treatment algorithms, and the accurate reproducible sizing of lesions is important. In this study, the authors evaluated the inter-rater and intra-rater reliability of and correlations in relation to various arthroscopic sizing techniques. Five lesions were created in each of ten cadaveric knees, International Cartilage Repair Society Grade 3C. Three orthopedic surgeons used four techniques, visualization and use of a 3mm probe, a simple metal ruler, and a sliding metallic ruler tool to estimate lesion size. Repeated measures data were analyzed using a mixed-effect linear model. The differences between observed and gold-standard plastic mold values were used as the response. Intraclass and interclass correlation coefficient values for intrarater and interrater reliability were computed, as were overall correlation coefficients between measurements and gold standards. The mean lesion size was 2.37 cm squared. Rater, lesion location and size, and measurement method all affected the cartilage defect measurements. Surgeons underestimated lesion size, and measurements of larger lesions had a higher percentage of error compared with those of smaller lesions. When compared with plastic molds of lesions, 60.5% of surgeon measurements underestimated lesion size. Overall, the correlation between measurements and gold standards was strongest for the simple metal ruler method and weakest for the visualization method. Conclusions Several factors may influence arthroscopic estimation of cartilage lesion size. The lesion location, measurement tool, surgeon, and defect size itself. The intrarater and interrater reliability was moderate to good using a 3mm probe, sliding metallic ruler tool, or simple metal ruler, and was fair to moderate using visualization only. Next, you'll hear a commentary by Dr. Mark R. Hutchinson on the article entitled Interrater and Intrarater Reliability of Arthroscopic Measurements of Articular Cartilage Defects in the Knee. Hello, this is Dr. Mark R. Hutchinson providing commentary for the June JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled Interrater and Intrarater Reliability of Arthroscopic Measurements of Articular Cartilage Defects in the Knee. The title of my commentary is Does Size Really Matter? 
Flanagan and colleagues have created an elegantly designed categoric study with the singular goal of assessing the accuracy and dependability of arthroscopic techniques of measuring chondral defects in the knee. Their findings confirm what we know from previous studies. That is, arthroscopic measurements of articular cartilage lesion size can be variable and, in turn, impact decision-making regarding treatment or predictions regarding outcome. Ultimately, the authors convincingly demonstrate that the measurement of larger lesions is less reproducible and dependable than that of smaller lesions. This has important implications for clinical research. Further, they show us that dependable measurements are more likely in certain regions, that is to say the tibia is more reproducible than in others, that is to say the trochlea. Finally, they nicely demonstrate that certain measurement techniques, use of a sliding metallic ruler or a fixed metal ruler, are more dependable than the use of simple visualization. It should also be noted that observers in this study were fellowship-trained arthroscopists, suggesting that the outcomes might even be worse with less trained or less experienced surgeons. Ultimately, though, the study begs the question, does accurate measurement of size really matter? Are the differences identified by these authors real but not substantially different clinically? In this study, the differences between the gold standard, plastic molds of the lesions, and recorded measurements, as well as variations between the measurement techniques, anatomic locations, and examiners were rarely greater than 0.5 to 1 centimeter. Classic algorithms suggest that our treatment options differ when the size lesion is less than 2 centimeters, between 2 and 4 centimeters, or greater than 4 centimeters squared. I'm not sure that the therapeutic choices differ substantially enough whether a lesion is 2 or 2.5 centimeters, for example, or at least of various sizes in excess of four centimeters. Indeed, these authors nicely demonstrate that small lesions are more accurately measured than large lesions, suggesting that the measurement of lesions around the critical size of two centimeters is more likely to be dependable than that of lesions of greater than four centimeters. The large lesions would likely be treated similarly anyway, whether they are four or six centimeters squared. Be that as it may, the accurate measurements of chondral lesions may have important clinical impact and benefit, particularly regarding the prediction of prognosis and documentation of disease progression. Since this cadaveric study was not a clinical outcome study, the impact in these areas would require additional research. Ultimately, the authors should be commended for raising our awareness regarding the inaccuracies inherent to arthroscopic measurement of cartilage lesions in the knee. I would concur with the recommendations of the authors when measurements are in gray zones of treatment algorithms, it may be prudent to remeasure cartilage lesions prior to making treatment decisions. Indeed, these are the ideal lesions that would benefit from the most accurate tools of measurement available. Regarding the issues of whether size really matters, that is to say whether a very accurate and reproducible measurement is needed in all cases, when making definitive clinical decisions, this study does not answer this question. For marrow stimulation techniques, the lesion needs to be small enough to be contained with clean cartilage borders that bridge the load of cartilage stress. For autologous osteochondral transfers, the lesion can be bigger than the marrow stimulation, but is limited by the number of cartilage plugs available to fill the defect. Finally, for larger lesions, alternative options are required, including osteochondral allograft or cellular regeneration techniques. Ultimately, I believe the authors did a wonderful job in this paper uh, and uh, uh, made us more aware that uh, measurement can be important, but in terms of clinical outcomes, Lisa still begs the question, does size really matter? Thank you very much for your attention. Next, you'll hear the last abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Comparison of Anterior and Posterior Surgery for a Degenerative Cervical Myelopathy, an MRI-based propensity score matched analysis using data from the prospective multicenter AO Spine CSM North America and international studies by Dr. So Cato and Associates. Investigation performed at the Divisions of Neurosurgery and Orthopedic Surgery and Spinal Program, University of Toronto and Toronto Western Hospital, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Surgeons often choose between two different approaches, anterior and posterior, for surgical treatment of degenerative cervical myelopathy on the basis of imaging features of spinal cord compression, the number of levels affected, and the spinal alignment. However, there is a lack of consensus on which approach is preferable. 
The objective of the present study was to use magnetic resonance imaging, MRI-based propensity score matched analysis, to compare postoperative outcomes between the anterior and posterior surgical approaches for degenerative cervical myelopathy. A total of 757 patients were enrolled in two prospective multicenter AO spine studies, which involved 26 international sites. Preoperative MRIs were reviewed to characterize the causes of the cord compression, including single-level disc disease, multi-level disc disease, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, enlargement of the ligamentum flavum, vertebral subluxation spondylolisthesis, congenital fusion, number of compressed levels, or kyphosis. The propensity to choose anterior decompression was calculated using demographic data, preoperative MRI findings, and the modified Japanese Orthopedic Association scores in a logistic regression model. The authors then performed one-to-one -one matching of patients who had received anterior decompression with those who had the same propensity score but had received posterior decompression to compare two-year postoperative outcomes and 30-day perioperative complication rates between the two groups after adjustment for background characteristics. A total of 435 cases were included in the propensity score calculation, and one-to-one -one matching resulted in 80 pairs of anterior and posterior surgical cases. 99% of these matched patients had multi-level compression. The anterior and posterior groups did not differ significantly in terms of the postoperative modified Japanese Orthopedic Association score, Neck Disability Index, or SF36 Physical Component Summary score. The overall rates of perioperative complications were similar between the two groups. However, dysphagia, dysphonia, was reported only in the anterior group, whereas surgical site infection and C5 radiculopathy were reported only in the posterior group. Conclusions Anterior and posterior decompression for degenerative cervical myelopathy resulted in similar postoperative outcomes and rates of complications. Thank you for listening to this JBJS podcast. Please visit www.jbjs.org for commentary and perspective on many of the articles presented in this podcast and for more content of interest.